Good morning and welcome to this review of The Grey Prince by Jack Vance. So here is my copy. It's not an original copy, those are really pretty cool. Um, but I love the artwork on this one. You've got some really complex stuff happening there with the sails and the airships that are not the way they're described in the story, but never mind that. Um, I don't think I can get in close enough for you to see, but there's some really fascinating notions of ships with sail that glide across the tundra and that is in the book. It's wraparound art. It goes all the way to the back. Quite gorgeous cover, which is something I always love in my classic sci-fi. It's a Coronet and I think it's from 77. I think it was originally published serially in earlier than this came out. Uh, copyright 1974. No. First published in Great Britain, 1976. I mean, I guess it's 76. I guess it's Great Britain. Pretty pretty poor condition if you're a collector because it's got browning and it's got uh, colouring. Pretty good condition if you're a me because it's nice and floppy and easy to read. There's some flexibility on the spine so I don't have to worry about cracking it in two. Really enjoyed reading it. For me, that's a given. I'm fairly certain that there's never been a single book by Jack Vance that I didn't enjoy. And as I age, I like the books better and better. Teenage Omnivorous Reader, loved them, but missed a lot. I'm probably still missing a lot, mind you. I, there's so much in them that I almost certainly have to be. But as a teenager, I didn't really have that much social understanding. A lot of my social politics came from science fiction, which may not be great. Um, I enjoyed the characters. I enjoyed the cadence. I enjoyed the languages, and I still love all those things. But now I can see sophisticated little quirks and details, and there are a lot in this. Apparently, it was originally published by, with the names of the domains of Corophon. And the entire story is set on the planet Corophon. And the planet setting is a complex and intricate part of the plot. So we see it first through the eyes of, what is her name? I haven't made notes for this book, so I'm going off, I'm going off Wikipedia, but I pay Wikipedia, so that's okay. Okay, we see, we see the world first through the eyes of Shasain Sh Maduk. She is the da a daughter of... A land baron, as we're told, from the planet of Corophon. She's just come back from five years overseas on overseas, five years on another planet in we're told a school. She's obviously young enough to be sent to school, so we think I'm thinking high school, but she's very mature and self-possessed young lady, which makes you think university. We don't hear anything about her studies, what she studied, what she's interested in, really. She is basically come back to her world and she plans to go back to her home which is on the manor house of morning's wake and live there so shane so shane makes a wonderful vessel for the story to start it's kind of pov but it's kind of third person so we we see it entirely from the shane mini universe but we see her in th third person, so Shane saw, Shane thought, whatever. But because she's back from five years, and because she was more of a child when she left, it's a perfect vehicle for um, her brother and other people to tell us about the world, what's been happening, and the various pressures on it. So her brother Kelsey Maduke comes to greet her, and we're struck with a scene where they're both examining each other affectionately, but for the first time in five years. And we learn a bit about Kelsa's history. He was uh, attacked by a maybe wild animal, a maybe sentient being, which is a central part of the plot. And we later meet Gerd Jemises, who is a landowner from the domain next to Morning's Wake. And another central character that comes in later, they meet at a party. The way it's set up, the first part of the book is mostly Sashin and her world around her. She wants to go back to Morning's Wake, but because she's been away for a while, her brother and Gerd tell her all about the things that are happening on the planet. And 
That's how Vance introduces us to it. So Corophon is described as a planet that's been settled by humans a long time ago, long enough for the humans to diverge into their own particular subsets of humanity. Uh, it's got two main land masses separated by what they call the Persimmon Sea, which is really cute and pretty. I don't know much about the sea. It doesn't go into it. They don't, the sails that you see on the cover aren't for the sea. The sails are for the tundra. And you've got wind riders. They're a separate subset of um, native humans and Aldras. No, Aldras. And I understand that the wind riders are a subset of the Aldras. Then you've got a whole lot of more humans that came in later and they're the Utkas, if you will. Now the land barons are controversial because what they did is they came in guns blazing and they forced a settlement on the Uldras living there and they basically carved out these huge properties, hence land, land barons. Now Jack Vance suggests that we've got a whole different language um, and and uh, in an early footnote he claims that land baron is just the best interpretation of an actual word that is too hard to translate. I can't find that footnote. I didn't bookmark it. And I think by doing that, he's a trying to keep us, give us an open mind about what a land baron is and what it does, but also trying to suggest the antiquity of the world, which is also kind of a key theme of his. Now, Utkas, or new humans, also live on that second continent, which is Sintere. Sintere has basically become a very civilized, centralized, um, and hence, in Jack Vance's eyes, weak civilization, over-civilized, full of um, fashions and trends. And there's a small group of that call themselves the Mull, that will never not be funny to an Australian, um, who are the very loose and very minimalistic government and the, all that this um, world has. Now, Cezanne, Cezantara, Cezantara, oh God, S-Z-I-N-T-A-R-R-I-E, the second civilized um, piece of land, has got, of course, all the medical, all the healthcare, education, sciences, arts, etc., etc., and the land baron's position is that by their existence in the tundra area, they bring some of these things in reliable fresh water and other other and other elements of civilization um, to the Uldras who live there, which they otherwise wouldn't have. And they're not particularly land hungry. They aren't going there out there and grabbing more land, and they are forcing the Uldras off their land to conform to their expectations they basically do their thing so that's set up as a primary conflict political socio-political conflict in the book now the other thing that we learn and i'm info dumping on you but jack vance doesn't jack vance works us all very organically into the novel and we're probably about this far in before we even really truly understand everything that i've just said <laughs> And as well as the humans, recent or not, there is another species that they call Urja Urgels. E R J. What the hell? Somewhere here. I really, really shouldn't try to do these things without um, making notes and. Putting in bookmarks. Okay, there's another species. Ah, urgens. E A J I N. So urgens are a native species, but there's some mention of the fact that they can't be found in the um, fossil record. And there's another species as well, the morphets that are found the co in the fossil record. They're completely different and don't seem to bear any relationship to each other. There's some hypothesis about what exactly the each species evolved in, from in which part of the world. The Morfetsa on Cisantar, whatever, and are K 
caged behind a fence because they're so dangerous and so wily. There's no doubt that they're intelligent, but they're malevolent and they cause a lot of problems. The urchins come from the same continent, the Uaya, where the Aldras and the Land Barons live. And in the wild, they're considered as kind of, they're obviously mammalian. They've got, I think it's orange or, or tan and black fur. They've got long claws. They're vicious. However, they're being sold to the civilized Cezantes by um, Aldras, who are, sorry, Windriders, who are a subset of the Aldras, who are civilizing them and selling them off as um, servants. That's a lot, isn't it? I really have, that is a full info dump. If an author did that to me in the first, in the first part of the book, I'd be annoyed. I also need to mention there's a Society for the Emancipation of the Urgen in Cezante, of course, the civilized, and a few other civilization, civilization, oh, societies for civilization and freedom. What Jack Vance is setting you up for here, though, is a very nice, a rather complex discussion of when someone owns land and when they don't. And he's looking at how far back do you have to f go to find a real landowner. And I feel that that's fairly relevant to modern times, in fact. So I'm not going to expose the ending of it, but the main part of it is Sashin goes back to her mo mo home in Morning Wake, but she takes with her a rather interesting young man she met at a party, Elvo Glissom. Elvo Glissom has recently arrived on the planet and is now an um, involved member of the Society for the Emancipation of the Urgents. And Sashin is saying to him, well, you don't really know what the conditions are, out are like out there. Would you like to come and see? Because she's interested in him. And she's nice and he's a bit interested in her, so off he goes. He finds the Morning's Wake domain with the land barons a little bit unusual, but before he gets there, this, the sky craft on which they're travelling is shot down. And that happens after Sashin and Kelsey Maduk discover that their father, who'd been in another um, larger flying ship coming to meet them, had been shot down and was now dead. In his journal, he writes of a terrible, uh, an amusing joke which they use as the reason in the novel for them to go off into the wilderness, into these amazing deserts and plains to try and find out what it was. That's kind of the second part of the book. Um, and in this part, we, we go from following Sashin around, though we still learn certain things about her back home. We have an adventure in which Gerd Jemais, who's the uh, land baron from the neighbouring property, but a fairly young guy. Alvo Glissom, our pampered, pampered civilised man who's a member of the Emancipation Society for Urgens. Um, and there's a third character, which I can't pronounce. Sergek? Kerjek. Kerjek? Something like that. He is a native Aldra, but he works for Morning's Wake, and he always has. He's apparently a shaman and a bit of a leader. But he's also a tracker, and that's why he goes with Gerd to try and figure out um, where the Marduk father had gone before, in, before being killed in order to find this amazing joke. It's clear that he went deep into the Uldra lands and probably encountered some bad tribes. Now that journey is fascinating because it takes us away from the more civilised land barony areas and Vance is obviously drawing on a lot of colonization stereotypes for that and I would suspect they're especially colonization types for America and South America. There used to be this old TV show when I was growing up I think it was called El Dorado or Ponderosa or something like that and that's very much the kind of vibe I got from his description of the land barons. But they're a bit more sophisticated, perhaps. Anyway, good old guys living on the land. They maybe not, they maybe don't have gold fingernails and an epics of civilization, but they have their own society and they're fair within it. But then in the second part, which we see from Elvo's point of view more or less, 
they head off into the true wilds and we see more of the shamans, we see more of the different tribes of Aldras, and we see more of the world. And we finally find, found out this amazing joke. It is Jack Vance, so I love the writing. If you don't love Jack Vance's writing for itself, will you enjoy this book? Well, you may, if you're very much into social commentary, because this whole book in its own very gentle, very gliding narrative, I guess I'd call it, is social commentary. The Grey Prince of the title is a Erd, Oldu, Oldra young man. He was found as an orphan from a tribe that sounded like Golgoroth and was brought up on Morningside with a really, really strange nickname, Muffin. They called him Muffin, but his real name is Georgel. He was brought up alongside Sashin and Kelsey on Morning wake, Morning's Wake, but he seems to have developed an antipathy for the entire civilization, and he's now this activist living in, in Zizante, speaking out against the land barons and their occupation of rightful lands of the Uldra. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so that's the Grey Prince of the title. And we learn more about him. When Sashin comes back, she feels very kindly towards him. She remembers the playfellow muffin of their childhood. She asks her not to call that anymore. Please call him Georgia or the Grey Prince or a few other big titles. And he's setting himself as this big activist. A point that's made very gently and early on is that all these activists that the Cezanta Society are basing their their um, objections on are all ones that aren't actually living on Uaya anymore. They've come and lived in, living in civilization complaining about it. He has got a lot of other good points as well, which I like. So that's the Grey Prince. So Shane feels kindly towards him because she remembers him as the saviour of her brother, Kelsey Maduk. Just before they, just before she left the planet, so about five years ago, Kelsey was mauled by a wild edge, edgen, edgen, uh, that big furry animal I was talking about before which isn't on the back of the novel, so I can't tell you. Anyway, and um, Muffin, or Jojo, was allegedly the one who saved him. So Sashin remembers him very kindly. But did Jojo really save him or not? That's an excellent question. And what Jojo's in involvement in these sea shark... They sound... They sound like quick electric bikes of the sky that come out of nowhere and uh, blast flying vessels out of the sky and then vanish again so it's even with all that info dumping that i've just done for you i'm still not doing justice to the complexity of this novel it's incredibly complex jack vance has created a planet he's created multiple, multiple species and societies in it he's fleshed them out a lot there is so much there he's created these beautiful wastelands that they travel over and he describes the ship and how they manage the sails perfectly. He's just an incredibly complex, incredibly beautiful writer. The characters are all good. As is often the case, I feel, with Vance, his characters are almost emotionally uninvested or uninvestable by the reader. You watch them like you would watch an actor, but you don't weep or bleed for them. They're not that much really a part of you they are the vehicle for the story so that probably won't be everyone's cup of tea in this day and age in this day and age the writing seems to want an awful lot of personal involvement an awful lot of investment and crying and bleeding with not very interesting characters sorry that was a judgment some of them are very interesting just not all of them anyway so this so you've got all these different plots happening simultaneously, finding where they're going in the wilderness and what the Elder Maduk found. Um, the reformers of Cezanne pushing against the land barons. The land barons decide to form their own society. 
and stop recognizing the moles um, authority the urgens are they intelligent or aren't they because that'll make a huge difference and where do the morph morphotes the, the other original species come from if any and how do they fit in it's a great book the ending feels a bit like a trial ending because they're talking in front of a senate and there's a lot of exposition there's a lot of type speeches i enjoyed it thoroughly i like courtroom exposition i think i've natted on enough about this you're either you're either gonna like this or you aren't and whether you do or not is heavily reliant on how much you like the really classic old science fiction sff i guess some people could argue this is, there's not a lot of science here um what is it someone called it a planetary romance i think i mean whatever sff for me and uh, jack vance's writing if you like jack vance's writing you will of course like jack vance the great prince thank you for watching have a great day